Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast that explores Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. Jimmy's at work, and uh, you know what happens. When Jimmy is stuck at work with clients and whatnot, uh, then you know I'm just going to bring somebody on. And uh, today I'm really excited to bring on uh, somebody that's been on the podcast before, someone uh, I consider a friend and uh, a great theological influence for me, uh, Sam Renahan. Sam, we're so grateful that you, uh, you're making time to come on the podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks, Joe. I'm happy to join you once again. So if you guys don't know, most of you do, most of our listeners do, but Sam is the pastor of Trinity Reformed Baptist Church in La Rimada. How do you really say it? La Mirada. <laughs> I don't think that's right. La Mirada. La Mirada. <laughs> California. Uh, Sam writes a lot, and uh, hopefully you've read some of the articles and books that he has written, but uh, God Without Passions is a, a wonderful uh, primer special. That's the, the perfect thing to read if you're starting to get into divine impassibility. Uh, the Mystery of Christ, His Covenant, and His Kingdom, Deity and Decree. Uh, your newest, right? Crux Morse and Fury, a primer and reader on Christ's descent, which, by the way, did not enjoy reading that book. I'll just tell you right now. <laughs> did not enjoy. I think I might have even said that in the little blurb I gave. What I mean is, uh, you know what? I, I don't like having to change my mind, I, or I don't like you know when like everything that I, I believe about something is 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 seriously questioned and uh, like thoughtfully, biblically, historically. And boy, you did it with that one, man. I was uh, I was like, I can't believe this. This is where Sam's going to say, all right, we'll see what this book's all about. <laughs> read that book and I'm like, oh well, shoot, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> I might be wrong. I might be wrong. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, man, just, yeah, love, love your writing and, uh, and your teaching. Uh, you're married, uh, to, uh, Kim and you have a son named Owen, right? That's right. Very cool, man. How are, how are things in California? How's ministry there? It's going well. Um, I've heard from a lot of other pastors, not just in California, that they've enjoyed sort of a post-COVID boom. Hmm. Uh, and that's certainly been the case for us, that COVID was a very difficult time, especially living in California where the restrictions were, they were what they were. Yeah. And we had to decide how to face those. So that was a real challenge. The Lord blessed our church. And, and I think that we came through it really well. But moving out of that this year, we've seen... Um, many new members and baptisms in our church and they've continued throughout the year so we've we just thank the lord for a season of growth for a season of blessing um after you know some fallow fields <laughs> in the years past so we're very thankful for that um and uh, we're going to be doing our beach camp in just about a week and so i'll be teaching there i'm looking forward to that that was something that i went to when i was but a wee lad and it really enjoyed that. And now my son is going. So uh, it's, it's a busy time for our church. Yeah. We have a lot of things going on. Our VBS is coming up. Our men's and women's groups are doing things. So we're very encouraged. We're very, um, very thankful to the Lord for, for blessing us and continuing to bless us. What is beach camp? So since we live here on the best coast, mm -hmm. uh, we have not just beaches, but we have state beaches in a few places with camping available at those beaches. And so we reserve a group site at a state park or a state beach and we, we camp there and it's true camping. You know, you show up and it's dirt and uh, picnic tables and a common state beach bathroom for the whole campground to, to share mm, elsewhere. Those are pleasant. So it's, it's not glamping. It's, it's real camping. We bring the tents, we bring the food, we bring everything. And the kids learn, you know, how to work hard and, and camp. But during the day, once the work is done, which most of it's on the setup day and takedown day, during the day, we spend the day at the beach. And then in the evening time after dinner, we have a, a short message that I'll be doing those messages every night. And on the Lord's Day, we do a, more of a, a full church service in the morning and in the evening uh, with, with beach in between. So the kids spend time playing at the beach, having fun, getting to know each other, as well as having teaching and worship times throughout. And then we also have some small group times in the morning for the girls and for the guys and things like that. It's, it's a great time. It's really quality time with leaders and kids and good teaching. And it's lots and lots of fun. 
It sounds awesome. Can I come? Is that like, is there a way to, sure, okay. Yeah. Do just... you want to be a speaker next year? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a speaker. I'll just be a, I'll just be a, an attender either. I'll, I'm happy to come. That sounds like a lot of no, fun. No, it's, it's really great. You know, I was, uh, I was telling everybody, you know, as I was in Anaheim and you told me that that's just like 15 minutes away from where you live. Uh, my favorite thing uh, about Anaheim was that uh, in the general area was there's like a donut shop on every block. I can't believe how many <laughs> donut shops were there. And I was just every day eating my fill of donuts. It was awesome. Yeah, finding the good one is the is the challenge. Well, I liked um, M and M. That was the one I went to a few times. M and M Donuts, and they had the uh, the Vietnamese iced coffee to go with it. So, yeah, it was oh, good. Interesting, was good, good time. So, um, now there at your church, are you guys are part of a of an association, local association, or national association. That's right. We have a local association, uh, the Southern California Association of Reformed Baptist Churches. And I think we have 11 churches right now, which is a good amount. And we're pretty spread out geographically uh, from Bakersfield in the north down to Vista in the south and east and west also. But we are local enough that we meet quarterly, uh, not just as elders or, or messengers, but also we have quarterly gatherings of our churches. So four times a year. We, we all join, or as many who can, uh, they drive and we all meet for a gathered combined worship service at one of the churches in the association. So it's, it's really a wonderful blessing to have a truly local mm. association of churches. It's something that many other people would love to enjoy, but can't simply right. because they just don't have enough sister churches or any sister churches maybe in their area. So to have 11 that are close enough to regularly assemble themselves on a quarterly basis is, I mean, we're living the good life ecclesiastically yeah. <laughs> um, to have that many around us. So yeah, that's, that's our association. And, and we put on our conference in uh, first Monday, Tuesday of November every year, the Southern California Reformed Baptist Pastors Conference. And we, our church is hosting the next, what we call our quarterly gatherings at the end of July. So everyone will come and hang out in our church and we'll have food afterwards. And it's a great time of fellowship and, and praising God together and hearing preaching. Well, I know it's a lot more challenging when you have, you know, more narrow or strict doctrinal parameters around which you're going to cooperate, right? Like the Southern Baptist convention that we're, we're a part of super broad tent. And you don't even really have to sign off on the statement of faith, like whatever, you know, they're just kind of <laughs> loosey goosey about it. That's uh, which is a point of frustration for a number of us. Um, but, uh, you know, someone on social media, Tom Agnew, he asked uh, if you could unpack what a healthy association would look like um, and what you, know, you can choose to just focus on on locally or you can more talk about it, you know, principally, uh, you know, in large. Yeah. I mean, associations do fairly, fairly basic things. They, they pray for one another. We help each other financially. We help supply pulpits. If there were problems or matters of difficulty and difference among people in a church or between churches, then the association is there to help give their advice uh, on, on those matters. So in a healthy association, I usually tell people, is built out, out of people and paper. You need to have good paper. You need to have a good constitution for your association that that defines the boundaries of your communion, the nature of your communion, so that everyone agrees. We mm. all ha clearly have the terms spelled out, but you also need people, good good Christians who are going to hold to that piece of paper and who are going to uh, truly put forth the effort to, to be with one another and spend time with one another. So for example, I said we're pretty spread out geographically, but whenever the, the last time we had a church join that was a little bit further away, uh, in Bakersfield, that's about a three-hour drive from us and would be further from some other churches. Our question to them was simply, "Are is your church willing and able to to make it to our quarterly gatherings? Right. Are, you, are you willing to be uh, a vital part of the life of this association? And so long as churches are ready and willing to do those things, we will pray for you. We will uh, supply what we can supply mm -hmm. to this association. And we will get together with you face to face. We will be together with you. Um, that's so great because it, it creates the relationships that become the context within which you can handle problems or difficulties. Right. You, you trust someone to go to them with a matter of difficulty or difference. You, you trust someone to rebuke you. you. You trust someone to say, hey, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but help me understand this. What's going on here? You know, I, we're concerned about you. We care about you. Would you help us understand this? 
Um, and so a healthy association has good paper, has good people who are actually doing the things or the work of an association. And again, I, I thank the Lord that I believe we have that in our local association and we, we definitely benefit from it. Sometimes it's very normal. You know, we have a messenger's meeting and we just hear church reports and pray for one another and we go home. But there's actually a benefit in that regularity and that normality, just like the local church. Every mm-hmm. time you come to church, it's not necessarily, you know, this um, amazing experience. It should be because we're worshiping God. But the the day, the, the week in, week out commitment of the local church is important for building up a, a true spiritual health. Well, so also the regular assembling and associating of churches is important for creating those relationships that you need to handle the problems when they arise or to cooperate in larger projects Mm -hmm. when they become available to you. So that's my opinion. I think it's great. I mean, we're, our church is not a part of a local association. So we're, we have them. Um, but it just wasn't healthy. And, uh, and even, you know, when, when I was a part of it and it was healthier, you know, years and years ago, um, you know, there was so much diversity that uh you know there's there's really I don't know, i'm just being honest when you're that diverse you you it's more difficult to get the kind of help you need because we have mm-hmm. different philosophies of ministry uh yeah. different uh theological commitments and so it's you know when you can and you can have something that is, i like being in the big tent because i think there are benefits to that uh mm-hmm. for us personally uh and then the influence that we might be able to have on some others but yeah, I, I, but at that local level, boy, I, I would, we would really benefit from more of that, and uh, and yeah, we miss it. Yeah, we enjoy it. So, um, covenant theology is it making a comeback, or is it like LL Cool J? It's been here for years. Don't call it a comeback. Like, what is? is you, do you see it growing? Do you see it like? Because it seems to me like it's it's growing, but I don't know if that's just social media talk or if there's actually an uptick. What What's your take? I think that. Covenant theology in the Baptist world is definitely growing uh, in a couple senses. It's growing in a larger engagement with the historical sources, uh, and I think it's growing in a larger sharing of more modern uh, interactions or or expressions of covenant theology. And of course, social media and things like that uh, have websites have served the purpose of um, spreading and making access easy uh, for these kinds of resources, whether it's the historical resources or more more modern things. So I think that there's been a, a good resurgence and a, and a continued growing of covenant theology in Baptist circles. It's not a uniform uh, view as though everyone believes the same things, but I think there's right. been a healthy even dialogue and interaction in many cases between Baptists themselves who may have different points of view. And I think that there's a growing... I think there's a growing um, charity and interaction that's happening with Pado Baptist brothers. Uh, as I look at certain certain groups or certain people who are reading more and engaging more specifically, like Richard Belcher's book uh, or the Reformed Forum, who have done a few uh, episodes trying to interact. And by trying, I don't mean that they fail necessarily, but right. they're making a sincere effort yeah. um, to to engage with those who would be more in in my camp of covenant theology. So I'm encouraged to see it growing in Baptists and to see that interaction spreading into Pado Baptist brothers and their circles. That's cool. Now, uh, so I'd, I'd like you to unpack a little bit for, especially for any listeners that maybe don't understand the the distinction, uh, that there are different forms of covenant theology, not only, you know, Pado Baptist covenant theology and, and Credo Baptist, but, uh, but even among, you know, Credo Baptists, there are some differences. So um, you know, you advocate what's been called 1689 federalism. Uh, what is the difference between 1689 federalism, that brand of covenant theology, and the Baptist covenant theology, say, of that was common among Baptists who held to covenant theology in the 20th century? Right. Just as a preface, I've said this before, but it needs to be said again that uh, we're generalizing here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this will apply to some degree and it won't apply to some degree. And, Fair. and I just want to be clear that I'm generalizing. So prior to uh, a greater awareness of the 17th century Baptist literature about covenant theology, uh, Baptist covenant theology among 
Reformed Baptists, as I have perceived it, tended to be what what I would consider as a more Presbyterian covenant theology that includes credo baptism, uh, where we practice credo baptism because in in the covenant of grace today, in the covenant of grace after Christ and the apostles, baptism is for disciples alone. And so therefore, profession of faith is necessary for baptism. Infants are excluded. Uh, and that's a valid argument. That's a completely valid argument, but it doesn't really change the covenant theology uh, of the Presbyterians that that would precede that would precede that. Whereas uh, 1689 Federalism represents the very strong majority view of the 17th century that disagreed with Pado Baptist covenant theology. Uh, very much about the Mosaic Covenant, but even more so about the Abrahamic Covenant. And so 20th century Reformed Baptist, Reform Baptists tended to understand the Abrahamic Covenant as the covenant of grace, just an older administration of it. And again, since we're in the new administration and uh, in, under the new covenant, we only ba- administer baptism to professing disciples. Whereas 1689 Federalism and the 17th century particular Baptists, the vast majority of them, though not all of them, would have said the Abrahamic covenant is not the covenant of grace in a older form, but rather it's a covenant uh, for Abraham and his natural posterity who are marked by circumcision. And of course, it's preparing the world for Christ. In fact, it promises that Christ will be born from those who are in that covenant uh, and it's subservient. It's not going somewhere other than the covenant of grace. It's leading to the covenant of grace or the new covenant, etc. But the, the, the point I'm trying to, to get at is that 20th century Reformed Baptists tended to view the Abrahamic covenant as being the covenant of grace under a different or older administration, right. and the new covenant being a newer administration, whereas 1689 Federalism on that point would argue that uh, God makes the covenant of grace with Abraham as a believer alone for himself, and God makes the covenant of circumcision with Abraham on behalf of his natural posterity and we should not confuse those two covenants. And so we don't practice credo baptism as a new version of circumcision or as a new administration of the covenant of grace, but as being a part of the new covenant, which is distinct from that Abrahamic covenant. And of course, there's many exegetical and theological arguments that go into why we're stating conclusions. Right. We're not stating really arguments, but that is um, a summary description of the difference of those two views. And this is something that you know, many Baptists uh, aren't aware of uh, that in my interaction that, you know, the arguments for credo baptism are oftentimes strongly grounded in covenant theology, not just we read our Bibles and we see it unfolding this way. And like, that's certainly a part of it, right? You see the example of the New Testament, but it really is a theological argument that's grounded in, in covenant theology. Yeah. And that's why I said earlier that I think there's a growing awareness of that, both the historical sources and these kinds of arguments. Oh, I didn't know that these arguments are connected mm. or that there are, that these arguments exist, things like that. So hopefully there can continue to be a greater, um, a greater, a growing awareness uh, of the sources as well as the arguments. And for more on this, people can, can read your book um, on, on covenant theology. I think that'll, um, that'll answer some questions. We did have a number of people write in on Twitter, at least a, a few people ask specifically about the Abrahamic covenant and that, you know, in, in their estimation, or at least the argument that they're thinking of is that, you know, clearly uh, there is a, a reference to Gentile inclusion in the Abrahamic covenant. They're saying that there is a, you know, there is a promise that, uh, you know, to, of, of all of the elect in the Abrahamic covenant. It's not just for Israel. Does the Abrahamic covenant relate directly to new covenant saints in any way, or is it just a hard cutoff? Is it, is it that those that were a part of the Abrahamic covenant still had the promise of the covenant of grace, or is there something, anything in the Abrahamic covenant that applies to us directly? Right. So the way that I like to explain this is to think about, let's see, the left and right will get switched mm. in the video, right? Uh, whatever. So you have the Abrahamic covenant and you have the new covenant or the covenant of grace. And what's common between them is Jesus Christ. So the Abrahamic covenant provides Jesus Christ. Genesis 12, from the very inception of the mm. Abrahamic covenant, says in you and later in your offspring right. 
all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so the Abrahamic covenant is going to provide Jesus Christ, is going to provide the descendant who blesses the nations. But the blessing that he brings for the nations is the new covenant, the covenant of grace. And so the Jew and the Gentile have in common Jesus Christ. The Jew is his brother according to the flesh. The Gentile believer becomes Jesus' bride and his child and his brother through faith. Uh, And of course, a believing Jew would therefore join with the believing Gentiles in the new covenant or the covenant of grace. What's held in common between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant is Jesus Christ. And Paul, of course, talks about those who are born according to the flesh and those who are born according to the spirit or those who are Jews inwardly and outwardly. And so we can say that the, the, the believer in the covenant of grace shares Christ with the Jew in the Abrahamic covenant, but only by faith do we enjoy the blessing. Only by faith do we participate in what the offspring of Abraham brings to the world. And Abraham, of course, is made to be a, a paradigm as he believed. Mm-hmm. So also all his offspring should believe and the world should believe. And so we become Abraham's children, not by covenantal federal headship, but rather we become Abraham's children by imitation of his example. Many times in Jesus' ministry, he uses the language of father-son in terms of imitation. If the, if the devil is your father, then you do the works of the devil, and so therefore you are the devil's children. I am of my father. I do the works of my father. I am his son. And so also the children of Abraham— are the ones who do the works of Abraham, which is to believe in the promises of God. So we would say we are the children of Abraham, but not as though we participate in the covenant of circumcision, but rather because we have imitated his example in believing and thereby have enjoyed and received the blessing of Jesus Christ in the new covenant, which is for the whole world. Mm -hmm. So is the Abrahamic covenant done? Well, yes, its promises have been fulfilled of multiplied land, of multiplied offspring, of inherited land, and Jesus has come to the world and brought the blessing to the world. But you could say that the Abrahamic covenant lasts forever if you want to, because it's anti-type, the new creation, it's anti-type, the elect, Mm -hmm. and Christ himself uh, lasts forever. But that's not the covenant of circumcision itself. That's what it was preparatory for and uh, preceding unto. And it, having fulfilled its function, it does cease and it is taken away. We no longer circumcise. We no longer believe in the land for Abraham's natural offspring. And we're not waiting for the Messiah. He has come in the flesh and we rejoice in that. So is that your take on, on Genesis 17 or is it something different when it refers to the everlasting covenant? Is it that it's everlasting as it's fulfilled in Christ or does the word everlasting take on a different meaning? Yeah, when, when olam is used in the Old Covenant various times, it does not mean eternal, as in forever and ever and ever. It means that it will last as long as God has designed it to last. It will not expire on its own. So the Aaronic priesthood and the Day of Atonement and, a, and the tabernacle, a variety of those things are all called everlasting, olam. Uh, and so we cannot necessarily just run with that word to, but this covenant lasts forever. Right. Sometimes it merely means God will not remove this until he has fulfilled it. It will not expire on its own. God's purposes will stand. I mean, even in the Noahic covenant, we see things like this, where the world's going to be preserved until it's not. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's that sense of everlasting. Like you don't need to doubt it. Right. If God says it's everlasting, you don't doubt it. It will last. God will fulfill this, but it doesn't mean eternal mm-hmm. forever and ever necessarily. That's really helpful. And by the way, if 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 any of our, you know, Calvinistic Reformed Baptist friends uh, think like that this is all sus, like always oh, playing with words, you, listen, this is what it means to, to work hard at understanding biblical terminology and, and the way these words are, are used in their context. It, I know every Calvinist is gets annoyed when an Arminian goes, all means all. We just kind of roll our eyes and go, well, that's a little simplistic. Like, you know, and then we break it down like to the traditional all without exception or all, you know, uh, all without exception or all without, what is it? All without exception or all without uh, distinction. Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, all without exception. So it's like this, I think that's a really helpful way of, of understanding it. Certainly, 
um, is helpful to me. So, I mean, I definitely want people to, uh, to pick up your book, The Mystery of Christ. Uh, I, I think it's great. And again, it's uh, a, a number of these books that you've written, you call them primers, and uh, they're, they're, they're brief, you know, introductions to weightier, complex theological matters, but uh, they're, they, they're not covenant theology for dummies i mean it's it the, it's a these are rich books that i find to be really helpful uh, we think our podcast is like entry level we just want to introduce people to reform baptist thinking and point them in good directions um these books are great i hope people will will pick them up um what about uh maybe just like maybe a more general question and and it can be more specific to your context even but when you think about the various challenges and dangers that our churches are facing today um, what is one of the more significant challenges or dangers? No doubt we could give many mm -hmm. valid answers to that question. And if I had more time, I'd really like to think about that. Off, off the top of my head, it seems to me that our overall culture so by our culture, I mean American life and not just American life beyond that, but Americans. We're not even thinking about the church right now. Just modern society is more and more polarized um, and it's less and less willing to do dedicated reading. And therefore, our public discourse, which usually takes place on social media, is extremely deficient. We we tend to sort things into polar binaries. You know, it's this or that. And the other is evil <laughs> and right. demonized and such things. And they won't take the time to listen to, to someone else and to really read what the other person is saying or, or writing and things like that. And so uh, this, we see this in, polit in politics or political discourse all the time. Now, I, I abominate politics. <laughs> I, I loathe it. But Unfortunately, over the past two years, we've all had to uh, talk and think things through as yeah. we deal with the civil magistrate. And we've all seen how even church aside, people vilify others, but we've seen it within the church too, is vilifying mm -hmm. other people and demonizing them and just being dismissive. So where I see this effect in the church is not just that, but Ecclesiastes says, don't say that the former times were better than this because this also is folly. But it seems like in our day and age, people just don't read. Yeah. Um, they don't, they don't read. And, and you know, I'm probably wrong. I'm probably wrong because this is a perception, but it, it seems to me that people, they read blogs and they read social media and they, they read new things, which are helpful in their own way. But I want people to spend more time looking back and reading older sources and having the patience to dig in those older sources and, and really draw from them because there's a richness and there's a benefit. And I see the church today ha struggling to defend itself because it's neglected older arguments, because it's neglected older sources and not just struggling to defend itself, but running unintentionally into errors. So when I look at things like EFS, ERAS, uh, and, and other doctrine of God issues and other theological issues. I think to myself, man, it, we have to work so much harder to deal with these serious issues because there's a lack of awareness of older sources and a lack of engagement of older sources that would have handled this much, right. much easier uh, to help us understand the scriptures, to help us read the scriptures. Uh, so to me, it seems like... Um, an illiteracy, a, a, a relative illiteracy, an impatient, in an impatient illiteracy. <laughs> yes, no, you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely it's, right. It's maddening because we have now the resources through the internet to read everything. I mean, you Google right. Books, things that are not, that have been long out of print for centuries. You got you can have it on Google Books, and you can actually read it. So we have all of the resources, a lot of it for free all of it for free if you go to the library and use the internet there. So yeah. we have all the resources, but the the way that we've ingested information, you know, it really, mm -hmm. it went from, you know, the, those three minute news segments on HLN, Fox or CNN, like a three minute segment where you'd have two people argue one sentence is back and forth 
to tweets. And I, I just, I, so I, I see the same problem. And, and we, we talk about it here on the podcast that, you know, the, the ability to understand people that we disagree with is. Or even a desire. Yeah. Like you, you like have sincere desire. I want to understand what you're saying. But they don't. They, I mean, they, we, we don't, right? As a people, we want to dismiss, and it's just, it's easier. And I, maybe it's hard to make time uh, to read the classics when you got, like, you know, Stranger Things just dropped two more episodes, and one of them's two and a half hours long. So I mean, I gotta, you know, I gotta make time for that. I ain't got time to be sitting around reading all this yeah. stuff. And you know, that's I think part of the challenge is the culture, and I, I see it as. What you're talking about, I, th- I think we see the same thing, that the culture has become this way. And instead of the church and mass standing apart from the culture and saying like, no, we actually slow down and take the time and value understanding uh, ideas, mm-hmm. concepts, and arguments. We want to, because it helps us to help them. You know, I, I can't right. really adequately help somebody move from their position of error to a position of truth if I don't really understand why they're holding that position and what's so important about it and how it works internally for them. So I think that that's a good word, man. And if, if you don't have, the, I understand that many people don't have the time to just sit and read those things. Like I, I get that. But if you don't have the time to read those things, you shouldn't be talking about yeah. these things, you know? So don't, don't blabber on social media about doctrines that you're not taking the time to read deeply in. Uh, yeah. So James says, let not many of you become teachers. Uh, and I think that this is related to that impatient illiteracy, as you put it, that not only are people not reading enough, but they jump into arguments mm. and controversies and, and they teach. They just teach without a license, essentially, essentially. Yeah. unlicensed teaching, impatient teaching. And people need to talk less, read more. And anyway, I see it. I see this happening a lot when, you know, a leader that people are drawn to uh, and oftentimes they are very bold articulate, clear, black and white, absolutist. Um, and, and maybe they're right on, on most of the things that they're saying. But I found that oftentimes they're angry, the ones that I'm thinking of. But people gravitate towards them because they're so clear and certain in their articulation. And, and it sounds right. It sounds biblical. So they take the position and then they run with it and get into fights online holding to the position that maybe is correct, but they haven't actually done the work to properly understand it. And so they Mm -hmm. wind up actually turning people off from the position because they can't defend it. They can just say, yeah, but right. Yeah. But which, you know, they can assert it, but they can't argue it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, like Luther said, there, there is no Christian faith without assertions, but you can't get there without the argument. So, um, all right, listen, we got, we got a few more, uh, a few more questions that people wanted me to ask you. Uh, Okay, <laughs> maybe I, it's very possible that I'm the dummy. L- let's just agree, I am the dummy. But people were sort of... Uh, uh, That's debatable. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that it's debatable. Jimmy would not debate that. He would just say that is that is a fact. All right, well, let Jimmy be the referee. Okay. Jimmy says... Okay. Jimmy, Jimmy <laughs> whatever he says is good. Uh, people were asking, did Eve sin before Adam? And uh, yeah, so there's a question for you. Uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14 that Eve was deceived first and became a transgressor, and then she seduced her husband or, or deceived him. So, yeah, she, she sinned first. So I, I think people are, are, are struggling with the idea that, you know, but why do we always go to Adam? And, and I saw people articulate in response, headship, federal head. You know, that's why Adam was the representative. Uh, but people didn't seem to be satisfied with it. But okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's I think that's a, that's what I expected you to say. Um, well, it's, yeah. it's one thing to say that Eve sinned first. Like, you could just settle that question. But the, the related questions, they're like these theological implications. And there's other questions behind the question that people are ask, actually asking. And if they don't specify the question, we shouldn't trouble ourselves about trying to figure out the question behind the question. Right. Okay. And maybe they did. Like, listen, guys, if you did, and I didn't get to what you were talking about, sorry, I've got a lot of responses. Uh, a guy named Drew Grumbles, and if, Drew, if that's your last name, you have the best last name. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I know it's not a virtue. God does bring all kinds of trouble to his people when they grumble, but uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to be a complainer, so I love your last name, if that's what it really is. He said, how do you make time to write and study while serving as a pastor? Well, without going into detail, the circumstances of my life enable me to have, at times, more freedom than others would in the same vocation. But the fact of the matter is that most of my writing and the related reading or research has been done at night. Um, and so my nighttime working energy decreases over the years. <laughs> it depletes. So that's been something I've been facing. But much of what I've researched, read, and written um, independent of the ministry, you know, if it's not like sermons or something converted into a book, then it's usually at night. Um, for for personal life reasons, I'm often I often have freedom to do that, and I've used that time when I've had the energy to to do such things. So you're not uh, you're not spending your all your nights binging uh, episodic television. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you got some no, time for some TV, but I do. I I have a young son, and, and I love to watch movies and shows with him. So okay. we we definitely enjoy that entertainment and other other kinds of things that we do together. But um, but yeah, there's also there are many hours in the day, many hours in the night, and uh, I try to use as many of them as I can. People never ask me uh, how I find time to write my books because they're so small. Uh, I, you could probably write them while you're uh, going to the bathroom. So, um, Okay, so another question is, is uh, what actor looks like you and why is it Sean Astin? <laughs> Sometimes people say Kevin Bacon. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm happy to be identified with Sam Wise. Yeah, right. Amgy. Yeah. So you can't prove I'm not him, you know. No. Uh, I, I think it's a good listen. I never get that's a compliment. I never get that kind of a compliment. All right, and then uh, Sam J. Garner wanted to know: Could you give a few of your favorite metal bands? If you guys don't know, I'm not the only one that likes metal. Although nobody's writing articles about you being a pagan because you like heavy metal, or maybe they have, and I just haven't seen them. Oh dear! But you do like heavy metal, and uh, what hmm. what are a couple of bands that you really like? So my niche in metal is really two things folk metal and melodic death metal yeah mm -hmm. so a lot in common my favorite bands would be winter sun and seferum moon sorrow um kalma corpiclani night wish um let's see teresa's elvati mm, i know i'm forgetting one uh, eternal tears of sorrow <laughs> what a great name <laughs> some great stuff uh, fin troll, not so much, but fin troll is pretty cool. And it's a little goofy. Oh, insomnium, I gotta say, insomnium and swallow the sun. Um, mostly Scandinavian bands. Yeah, same. Yes, uh, insomnium is one of my for American hardcore. Mm -mm. Um, no, because we want melody in the midst of the exactly. complexity. Yeah, man. I, I just found. Uh, I think I might have mentioned it on Monday's episode, but I just discovered a band that I'd never heard of. A Scottish band called Saor S A O R. It's a Scottish metal band. And it's kind of like a doomy, melodic death, explosions in the sky kind of a thing. There are very little lyrics, um, but epic, epic melodies, especially like, you know, the second half of their seven or 11 minute songs. And uh, they'll bring in bagpipes and strings with it. Uh, nice. It's pretty great. So I'll send you a link. Uh, sure. That's cool, man. So any books coming up? Anything that you're working on right now that you can share? Um, my only writing goal for this year is to finish part two of my Petty France history. That's Baptist history. Lord willing, there'll be more than just those two parts, but that's what I'm trying to finish. It's mostly done, but I've been very busy the first half of the year, and I'm hoping to just finish that. It, it's my least popular uh, work, but probably my most cherished work mm. um, because other people could write covenant theology, other, other people could write th theology proper, and they do, and that's great. But there's, there are very few people in the world doing primary source uh, Baptist history research, especially in the 17th century. Mm. And so it's my delight to sort of contribute to that field in a way that is truly not unique, but um, 
just other people aren't really doing yeah. it. So I feel like it's a special, special contribution, not okay. unique, but a special contribution that I can make to, to literature. And if people don't read it, that's fine. Uh, I don't, don't care. I'm doing it because I want to do it. So you just gotta, that. All right. We got to, we, we got to back up because you say petty France, like everybody knows what that is. That sounds like a brand of skinny jeans at H and M. So what is petty France? First of all, I'm offended. <laughs> Second of all, uh, in, in London, it's not there anymore. There was a small little part of London called Petty France, which is like we have in our cities. If you have like a little Tokyo mm-hmm. or little China or whatever, you know, little Britain, it's like that Petty France, Petite France. And there was a Baptist church that met in Petty France, London, which was pastored by Edward Harrison and then Nehemiah Cox and William Collins. And it was very much at the heart of Baptist life in the 17th century. Cox and Collins, of course, most likely edited the confession. Uh, the Petty France Church book, their book of records, is the first um, the first literary mention of the Confession in any record in the world. So it's it's very much at the heart of particular Baptist and confessional Baptist life in the 17th century. And I've been doing research on that church and its pastors, its deacons, its members, and just Baptist life flowing out from that church. I have this big family tree that I've created with over a thousand people in it of just so-and-so married, so-and-so married, so-and-so married, so-and-so, and and they had kids and kids and kids and kids and kids, and it goes on and on and on. So it's a lot of, a lot of research, very research heavy, and it's, I'm, I'm there for it. I'm down for that. Wow. I think that sounds amazing. And uh, yeah, man, very, very cool. We appreciate you making time to to come on the podcast. Uh, We'll be linking to all of your books and encouraging people to get them if they have not already. But uh, Sam, really, Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on, man. It, it it means a lot. Thanks, Joe. I had a lot of fun. Well, we would uh, love for you guys to interact. You can interact on uh, social media, right? You can join the conversation. You can leave us feedback. You can tell us that we're too nuanced or whatever you like. At Doc and Devo, that's uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and if you want to support the podcast, if you like what we're doing and you're not a hater, uh, you know what? You can join All Access. Uh, there you'll get exclusive commercial-free content. Uh, it's You can subscribe to All Access right in your podcatcher, whatever you're listening to this on. You can probably scroll down, look at the link that says support this podcast, click on that, and you can sign up. You get exclusive commercial-free content like our Banter of Truth podcast. It happens every Tuesday and five days a week, devotional meditations called Weekday Wisdom. We appreciate you guys. Thank you for listening. Spread the word and let people know we got uh, Dr. Sam on. It's good stuff. Thanks. 